I'm Joel Beckerman. I'm a composer and I'm the founder of Your Music, Your Future. And I'll be giving a shameless plug later. But basically, uh, yeah, uh, Your Music, Your Future is, is about uh, composers helping other composers, uh, especially understanding their contracts and how they uh, might um, really maximize their opportunity in terms of having a career. So we are really fortunate to have three extraordinarily talented and award-winning composers. We have Pinar Toprak, and uh, you may know her. If, if you don't know her, you, you've been hiding under a rock or you're just starting out in the industry, but uh, she has uh, worked on Captain Marvel and Fortnite. We have John Powell, uh, known for How to Train Your Dragon and the Jane Bour uh, <laughs> Jason Bourne franchise. I'm going to tie my tongue back in my mouth here, I guess. Sid Kosla with This Is Us and upcoming Queen Pins and Only Murder, Only Murders in the Building. So welcome the three of you guys. I know you're all friends, so I can ask a couple questions and just let you guys do the do the hard work and I can just kind of let you do your thing. But um, Pinar, I want to start with you. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about your background, your training, and what led you to film composing. Um, I'm from Istanbul originally. Uh, I have a very um, boring all music background. Uh, <laughs> started when I was about five years old uh, playing the violin and uh, then eventually got my degree in classical guitar, uh, kind of playing piano and writing all throughout. Um, I fell in love with films quite early on and realized that that actually is a job option. <laughs> and once I realized that, soon after I realized I couldn't do that in Turkey at the time, so <laughs> the mission was then to move here. Um, I moved here at 17 um, and uh, studied jazz in Chicago for a bit and then went to Berkeley College of Music, did film scoring there and moved to LA got my master's in composition. And then my first job was at Paramount Pictures Music Department. I was like 19, 20 years old at the time. Um, and then- What were you um, doing at, what were you doing at Paramount? So I was, I was, while I was getting my master's degree, they reached out to the, the department chair there uh, for, for an intern. And I was in the music department. I was basically working like in the music clearance cue sheet side of things actually, uh, which was, I mean, I didn't know anything about it beyond kind of what we learned the basics of at Berkeley. Um, so that was really, really great understanding how all of that works. But the best part of it was there used to be a scoring stage there, which sadly is no longer there. I was there every single day um, and I got to meet everybody. And it was the kind of experience that I would pay for. But I was an intern just kind of hanging out and uh, learning from the master. So that was that was pretty awesome. It sounds like uh, really uh, a lot came out of that internship for you, both on the business side and the creative side. That's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Um, Sid, different background, similar background. Tell us a little bit about you. Um, similar in that there's, a, there, there's an immigrant background. Um, my, uh, my parents came, um, came to the U.S. in the late 70s from India. Um, and, and then I was born here, um, not here, but in, in, um, in Connecticut. Um, and my parents were in school full time and uh, working jobs around the clock. And um, as soon as I was born, um, they uh, they realized that they didn't have enough money to take care of me here. Um, so they saved up enough money to send me back to India wow. to be raised to be raised by my grandparents um, when I was really little for like the first few years of my life. Um, and then eventually my parents were able to bring me back back to the U.S. But um, at the time, there was, uh, um, you know, there was, it was $24 a minute to make a long distance phone call. Um, and my parents came to this country with eight. So you can do the math and realize that they didn't get to call me much. Um, but they would send me cassette tapes and my mom would sing me old Hindi songs. Um, and uh, my grandparents would, uh, would record over that same tape. Um, um, and where I would say something unintelligible back to my parents um, so they could hear my voice. Um, but that was my first experience in recorded music um, <laughs> on those cassette tapes. And um, I grew up with a lot of Indian music as a kid. Just uh, I grew up um, when I came to the U.S. I was that kid that would um, sing at Temple. We would have these uh, Sundays in Temple 
And um, I would be the six or seven year old kid um, singing in front of 200 Indian people, um, nervous every single Sunday morning, um, but would sing all these old Hindi songs. And that's sort of like how I learned music and how to sing and listen um, to all the different inflections in, in, um, in, in the Indian singing. Um, and then eventually I, um, my, my sort of path to music, uh, to scoring was different than Pinar's. Um, and I would imagine John's as well from what I know, know of him. But um, I, I was in a band and um, I was in multiple bands as a singer songwriter of a band called Gold Spot. And, um, and then that I was, a, I was an artist and on Universal um, signed to um, a deal there um, and my albums came out in the UK and here and worldwide and um, and 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 did not do very well um, but they had um, they had like it was all in sort of like this time of streaming when um, when my albums came out it's like 2005 2006 it was like right at the peak of like streaming hitting so all of a sudden these like albums that I worked on that had gotten a lot of love um, critically from press or whoever else, um, they didn't sell what they were used to selling in the past. Um, and, uh, and so my path sort of diverged a little bit. And eventually, um, um, a, a friend of mine from college who was a fan of my m music and my band called me to score his first television show. And, um, and that's how it started for me. And I started scoring film and TV. And now wow. that's what I do. It's quite a journey. So what uh, the musical background, how do you think that influences the way you score sort of the musical sensibility that you bring to your work now? I think um, because my education came from sort of like writing my own music from like a very, very young age um, in bands um, and then listening to all that old Hindi music as a kid. Um, so like, expressive, it, it, right? Such expressive oh, yeah. singing. Yeah. All that stuff, it was like, like one of those songs was like from the child of my childhood, it was like, hey, mere pyare vatan, hey, mere chaman, da, 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 da. like stuff like that. Um, so for me, it was always like melody driven. And, um, and so uh, all that education and sort of writing my own music and listening to what my mom would sing me and, um, is what I kind of brought into what I do now, which is like very melody driven. Um, I, and, and so it allows me to think very thematically with, around whatever I score. So, that's so great. That's so great. And it really obviously comes out in your work as a unique, uh, unique talent and unique sort of sound that you bring. John, how about you? Um, very different background I, from what I know, but tell us about it a little bit. <laughs> It's, it's funny, you know, we're, we're all immigrants, but I'm definitely the immigrant who uh, being, you know, white male got a lot, <laughs> clearly got, got here a lot, um, you know, with a lot more advantages. The, immediately, the, the advantage you get if you're English is people think you're smart when you've been, ed when you've been educated well, um, which if you're from England, you'd know I wasn't and I hadn't. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I only came here because I, you know, wanted to work in film, of course, but it was much, much later in life. And it was when I had plenty of money and a uh, very different story. Um, so so what were you I'm, doing? What were you doing before you start? You began film scoring? Well, you know, I mean, I, I just always liked music. Uh, my father was a musician. Uh, so I was taken to sessions and things and, uh, and film sessions as well, but lots of concerts. And, but it all started with the classical music. And then tried playing instruments wasn't good enough really and eventually had to sort of do something in music to keep up with everybody else and I thought well composing's probably I can get away with that you know which is really sort of just organizing everybody um and and so I, I you know I went to college and and then I became a tape op worked at a you know rock and roll studio for a, a while which was very useful very useful learned, learned a lot from that um, wanted to actually produce records, but <laughs> discovered that I didn't really like a lot of people's music. <laughs> so it was very, it's very hard to be a producer unless you're a real fan of people's music. And, and you know, and that, so it, uh, I would always, you know, I'd be producing sort of bands and then complaining about their, you know, their, their <laughs> harmony things, which is really <laughs> stupid. So I wasn't mature enough to do production. So I ended up doing advertising music. And then from there, I, you know, I just kind of pursued that. I mean, I, while I was doing advertising, I was doing um, a lot of installation art music, 
uh, for you know video installations and uh, crazy stuff like that. That that and the 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 adverts seem to be a good way of kind of paying for that. Um, I, I like the idea of that rather than trying to get grants from you know the arts council and things. Um, it sounds like you really were able to experiment a bit in those uh, those video installations. What what was that like? What what do you think you got out of those experiences that you bring to your work now? Oh, I, I mean, we definitely went you know, into some crazy stuff. Um, you know, I remember <laughs> one piece got played on Radio 3, um, which is a sort of a classical, fancy BBC classical station. And my grandmother heard it and said, uh, is that music? <laughs> 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 and it was quite an interesting question, really. She was, she was right. I was pleased because I thought, oh, okay, well, at least I'm not, you know, it is a bit different, at least. But then I did think, Maybe I'm going to have trouble making a living at this. So, um, so the adverts kind of took over, and then you know, and then some TV and a few things, and then I, I met Hans and uh, just helping out, just technical. I was I was good at technical stuff, and so I, um, that's how I ended up. I was the kid who bought lots and lots of gear with all the money I was making, as opposed to anything else. And so I ended up with a stack of gear and really into the gear, and and that meant I got connected with Hans when he came over to do. A few things, and uh, and that was my connection. It's great. Hey, um, John, tell us a little bit about at what point in your career did you understand? Because obviously, you sounded like you were doing very well, very well in the advertising scoring. At what point did you realize in your career that it was really important, uh, really vital to understand the business side of of uh, the business and how that worked? Um, how did you learn that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's the business side sort of technically and there's the business side of being good you know a good product for what people need <laughs> um you know actually being good at it which you're trying to learn on the fly but also then trying to sort of focus on how to get the next gig uh, so the iterations of advertising was useful for me because i i'm a bit slow so doing it over and over and over again i kind of got to finesse and understand a little bit more about what i was messing up and what was doing well and what got people interested and how, you know, how I could get a room to be of executives to be happier with something. And yeah. Sound like a little bit of journeyman training. Is that sort of much. fair? Yeah, yeah, very much, you know, and, and lots of, lots of things. Like I remember just, I used to do a lot of stuff in Paris and I, I would, I would fly over to Paris on a very early plane and arrive in the morning and, and be stuck in a studio. And I would have sent a list of, a few pieces of gear and it would arrived from the rental company and then I had to put it together and then and then the producer would say okay that by then it was like 11 o'clock and he'd say okay well this the, everyone comes at three so if you can just write something by three and then that's when you put in all the gear together and you realize that you need to update the software of all the s1000s and and then that floppy disk is <laughs> working and then you're taking the you know and it now it's one o'clock and you you're looking at the three o'clock coming and then you're taking the floppy disk apart and swapping floppy disks out so you can update, you know, the software on the firmware and, and, you know, and then you've got a SCSI cord that doesn't work. And then you're trying to get somebody to get you another SCSI cord and it's like two o'clock now. And then at, <laughs> at two fifteen it works and you know, they're walking through the door in 45 minutes. And so that was a very useful thing of like, can I survive this and not, you know, not die, run away, cry, uh, and actually have something by three o'clock. And that was one of the most important things for me was like, you know, if I can survive that, you know, the iterations again of that, the steps of not crashing and burning over and over and over again, gradually, I guess, gave me confidence that allowed me to walk into sort of Hollywood and, and not burn up completely. It's sort of a really big uh, theme. A lot of composers, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, said, what was the role of kind of just sticking through it? You know, there have been so many... Uh, composers who are talking about very brutal times or brutal experiences in different uh, projects that they work on or, or uh, you know, John just talked about technology. But, you know, what were the moments in your career where you just sort of felt like, oh, my God, it's all going to go to hell? And, and how did you get through those moments? Um, I think for me, like the first thing that comes to mind is um, is when I was, you know, when I was not composing film and television work, but when I was in my band. And um, I remember we had done, I had written this record that was like the best thing I'd ever done. I was very excited about it. And, um, 
And this was like maybe a couple of years, a year or two after 9-11. And I remember um, all of these like big sort of like heads of labels coming to my shows. And, um, and we were sort of like, I mean, we were very green at the time. Like all we really wanted was a record deal, thinking that a record deal was everything. You know, if you got that, you were set. Um, and, um, and at the time I had a job at AT&T Wireless in Los Angeles. Um, where I was trying to convince um, towns to put up um, what's called mono palms, which are the fake palm trees that have the um, the, <laughs> the built-in antennas to maximize cellular coverage. Um, so um, that was my day job, um, and um, and and I was so excited about getting this deal. I knew people were interested in the band, and I remember the head of one of like the pretty big labels. Um, had come back to my team, my manager at the time, and had said, you know what, um, we love his music, um, we, we think the band is great live, but we are not ready to sign um, a brown lead singer, um, especially with everything that's been going on recently. And I remember that being sort of a oh. very difficult thing to sort of like swallow, but you know, I was a, I'm a child of immigrants. And so I, 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 I've experienced some of this stuff as a kid too, on some level, you know? Um, and, and, and I think my father had always instilled in me this sort of idea of, in Hindi, we call it tapasya, which is like, if you do something, you do it with all your heart and your love, and that will be ultimately the thing that sustains you through. Um, and so I think that sort of like thinking has always kept me alive is, as long as I love to do what I do, that pa that love and passion for what I do should always be, will always be greater than the challenges that come my way. And so if I can approach my career that way, then I can get through these types of hurdles. Um, ultimately, we got, ultimately I got signed to Universal as an artist. Um, and, and then the label dropped me a year later, but that's a different story. Um, but, um, so there's, you know, and then obviously in composing, um, there have been challenges. Like I, I didn't go to school for this, you know? And so I didn't have the same sort of education going into it. All I had to sort of like work off um, in terms of like my history of orchestrating and arranging for groups of people were like my acapella group in college. when <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd have to arrange for 20 voice parts. Um, and, um, and then when I had recorded the uh, A.R. Rahman's Bollywood, his, his orchestra in Chennai, India for one of my albums, that was my experience with orchestra, orchestral work and arranging for people and people other than myself. Cause normally I just play on This Is Us, I play the entire score here um, from down to the drums on, the, on this table to whatever I'm making. So um, I think, uh, you know, for me, that was always the sort of um, the, the, the challenge when I started doing this was like, how am I going to score to picture when I really haven't done this? All I'd done was a couple of like Google ads or something or Target. I'd done some commercials, um, but the people I worked with felt like I had, um, they liked my melodies enough and they felt like I had an emotional connection musically. And they're like, that's your starting point. And then that sort of gave me the confidence to figure it out. That's really great. Panar, talk about your experiences in terms of, I mean, uh, whether an immigrant or, or other factors, uh, have you felt that you've had to sort of break through expectations as well? What's your experience been? I mean, I think all of us, regardless of where we have come from, you make a career by breaking expectations, <laughs> you know. Um, for me, I think the elephant in the room was um, well, there are two elephants. They're 13 and 15 years old right now. <laughs> um, there, I have a story with my younger son. I was pregnant um, and he decided to come early and I had a scoring session uh, and this was like, no. a so, and you couldn't cancel within four days, you know, so you're responsible for it. He, the first day of the session was a Sunday. He had the audacity to be born Friday evening. <laughs> Um, so that was stressful. And I remember as soon as my water broke, 
uh, I actually, <laughs> I called my team instead of like calling everybody else <laughs> because my brain was like, oh my, how am I going to get to this session? Um, but the, fu the funny story was I had to lie at the hospital to be discharged on Saturday so that I could actually get to the scoring session Sunday morning. So I had a 30 hour old baby. Uh, so that was kind of crazy because nobody knew I was pregnant. Both, both my pregnancies were, were, were secret. <laughs> I've I've heard a lot of stories, but that <laughs> that you know, pops, wins. yeah, that yeah. absolutely wins. Uh, that absolutely wins the challenge uh, <laughs> story of, of, of the the biggest one I've ever heard. So that's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, Pinar, just to stick with you for a second, it radically changed the topic. It sounds like re you you were working for a studio and you learned about cue sheets. Um, when did you realize how important uh, contracts were, um, what they did for you, uh, performance royalties? When did that actually kick in and, and how has uh, royalties and contracts really, what, what role has that played in your ability to, to feed your two elephants in the room? Um, I think it, it actually happened later on, to be honest. In the beginning, it was all about survival. So you're not even thinking you know, a year, a year ahead is like, you're not thinking, oh, next year or in two years from the international, I'm going to get this. And, you know, like, you're not even, you're just like, how am I going to pay rent this month? Right. So um, for me, it took a little while. I remember the, the very first check I received royalty check. It was, I remember like first sizable one was uh, I think like four or $5,000. Um it was massive for me. I was literally like, oh my God, I can go on a vacation. <laughs> I've never been on a vacation <laughs> like, since I moved here. Um, it, it was a big deal. And then I, you know, as, as projects evolve and as, they, as you start, I think, seeing back the money, oh, I really need to, to think about this clearly. <laughs> you know, um, it just, it, it took me a while to understand um, because, you know, you're trying to be a team player you're trying in the beginning you may not have an agent and you're trying to just like get the job deliver the job and you're being like you know yes sir yes ma'am i'll i'll do it i'll clean your floors on top of it you know <laughs> um and but pretty soon you start realizing the, the value um and that that took me a while even though i was working in the whole cue sheet thing i didn't think that i was Honestly, I didn't even think that big at the time I was just trying to get through. Yeah, um, that's, yeah, that, I think that that sort of story is pretty typical. We hear a lot about, you know, people kind of, like you said, sort of in survival mode from the beginning, just how do you get to the next project and how do you get to the next year? Um, Sid, can you just talk a little bit about what would your career be different and your financial situation be different in terms of being able to support you and family um, if you had, uh, instead of doing, you know, what we're talking about here, by the way, is work for hire projects, work for hire being that uh, in most film and television projects, you agree to relinquish the copyrights for your work in return for being able to collect performance royalties through the PRO of your choice, whether it's ASCAP or other ones that I cannot remember the names of. Um, but uh, that, that, is essentially a hundred year old deal that's existed from the beginning of the studio system. Um, I guess, Sid, my question is if, if you know, there, there are some composers now that are considering buyouts uh, because partly that's what is being offered. Partly, you know, Pernar, as you said, sometimes it's just like, I got to get my first credit, but Sid, how would your career have been different or your financial life been different had you taken buyouts from the beginning rather than performance royalties? Well, if I had taken buyouts from the beginning, I would effectively have no retirement money. Um, <clears throat> um, it's, I mean, I have sort of like, I, I make some contributions to uh, my own sort of like, um, what do you call it? My own SEP contributions for myself. But um, in terms of um, anything of substantial value, it would not be there. You know, basically like I could look back on the last like, in the last like four or five shows or films that I've done. Um, and most of my income comes from like my TV work. I've done a lot more television than film. I'm not as, um, I'm not as prolific in the film world as Pinar and John. Um, but uh, most of my um, work has come from TV. And 
Um, the royalties are substantial on television, especially if you have something that is a hit. You know, I, I remember, and this, and, and this is how I look at it, is like the very first, we talk about our first sort of like royalty checks we got. Um, I had, uh, and I first started my band, one of my songs was placed in some like, in some Jason Priestley movie that went straight to video. Um, but I got my first, um, my first royalty check and it was like something like 32 cents. And I remember laughing and thinking that this was a joke. I remember just being like, okay, I wasn't expecting anything anyway, but I had this idea in my head that the royalties were never going to be substantial, that they were always pennies. And it's only because I'd never had a hit, you know, and it was, I'd not had anything that had done well. But then when I started scoring for television and started doing some broadcast stuff and I started seeing the royalties go up. And then finally, when I landed This Is Us, um, I, it, I had no idea what to expect in terms of what was coming in. And when I saw it was coming in, I was like, oh my goodness, this is like, this could support my family for like the next several years, just this one year's worth of royalties alone. Um, and, um, and it was at that moment for me where I was just like, okay, I have to protect this at all costs. And I, and this is so important to me. I never realized that this is, and, and you began to see, you begin seeing your value in other ways. You know, one, my value is in one, in one way it's being hired for a fee to do the work on the show. Um, but then you're also contributing in a way to the success of that project. Right. And if you're benefiting from that, that's sort of like your equity in, in, in what you're helping build. Um, the scores that John and Pinar have done are, are beautiful. The, their work is stunning and it contributes to the larger picture of what people and audiences are experiencing um, all the way down to what advertisers are paying to be part of those um, shows um, to, to air ads or whatever else. So, you know, this is our equity um, in what we do and, um, and, 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 and we can't be living our lives in sort of sweat equity, <laughs> working for very little. Um, so it needs to be protected at all costs. Yeah. That's great. John, can I just ask you, uh, you know, um, Sid had mentioned value brought to projects. He talked about respect uh, to the work. So there's a financial component, but can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how does it, um, play out in your relationships with directors or studios, um, uh, the the nature of performance royalties and what it what it says about the value of your work. Honestly, I directors and producers, I've, as far as I know, they've never really talked about the royalty side of it. Other than I, a few directors <laughs> uh, have said to me, "You guys are lucky talking about composers." You know, uh, you know, talking about the royalties. It's a lot of directors in animation don't have very good deals either it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult side of the business for directors to sort of really kind of make it you know they make a lot of money for the studio sometimes but they don't necessarily because they're on films for such a long time i guess they're getting paid pretty well for that but they don't really get an awful lot of back end and we actually sometimes get very good back end and i think it it you know that's the only thing that directors have ever said about that i mean the, the thing you have to remember about a director is he wants you know, she wants the best person that they can get and how, and for the amount of money that they've been given in their budget, they want simply the best. And even if they don't have that for the budget, I was always aware of working, you know, part of Hans's thing was that you get gigs sometimes and, and you're working and playing things and there's always that look in everybody's eye, which is, really wish I could have got hands. Why, why have I got this kid? Why have I got this guy? You know, and so this idea of being cut price, a cut price version of really who everybody wants, you know, came home to roost with me. And it's a very useful sort of thing to keep in the back of your mind, which is, you know, they just want the most expensive, best person that they can get. And if they can't get that person, you're on a list. And depending on how far down the list they had to go to, and then ended up with you, there's always questions in their brain as to, is this as good as it can be? And so I've always tried to sort of, you know, take that on as a, a, a challenge, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, obviously I'm now in a slightly different position where, you know, I think people, you know, 
have a slightly different view of me. Um, but there's still always that, you know, well, what would I get if I'd got John Williams, was, you know, <laughs> would that have been better, you know, because he can write better tunes, you know. So in the back of everybody's mind is, is you know, there is a respect for us, but everybody wants somebody better, I think. And, and it's a really good, it's not a bad idea to consider yourself to be less than. And so you can at least sort of, you know, enjoy a struggle towards being better for the for the project. So uh, I guess my question, John, is um, based on that, you, you know, you were you were working, you had work to do, uh, you know, maybe you were considered second best or third best at a certain point, but there was a point at which you broke through and people began to recognize and you began to flex your own your own uh, creative voice. So can you tell us a little bit about that? What was that transition point? Uh, when did you realize that people were hiring you for your own composing voice? Um, I think it was born. Uh, Doug Lyman basically uh, got, I got a call, which is, uh, you know, there's this director, he's already had a composer and the two of them just sat in a room and didn't talk to each other. They, they're both a little bit kind of on the spectrum. And so they, you know, they basically said, we need somebody who, who will, find a way of engaging, I think. And that's perhaps something that I got a good reputation even at that point is. And, and then, and because it was, Doug just didn't know who I was, and, but he'd heard, you know, he'd heard some things and, I, and then I said some demos and he just liked them. So I came with no baggage at all for him. Um, and I, I think it was a point at which I really jumped on the, I thought, right, I'm gonna just try and do everything differently. And I got a sense from him that whatever everybody else was doing for action films at the time, I should try and do the opposite. Um, so it was a it was a opposite day kind of score, really. It was like it, you know, and I'd learned all of the hands, the Zimmer kind of things, which I do love. And I, you know, it was a wonderful kind of style of action music at the time, where everything's big and reverby. So I just did everything opposite. So smaller section, you know, everything was small, everything was dry, everything was. You know, I was fascinated by a, a mixer called Spike Stent, who, who mixed all the Massive Attack stuff and reading about him. And he never used any reverb. It was all just delays and filters on the delays and things. And I said, right, I'm just going to do everything with that. And, you know, and so I went down that rabbit hole a bit because I felt that Doug was going to not care. He was going to be kind of, I need some of that Zimmer magic sort of thing. He, he had no, no idea what that was. He didn't care. He knew he didn't want that. He didn't want Bond. He didn't want anything else he'd had before. So it was a that wonderful moment when you know there's sort of a there's a creative sort of void ready to ready for you to sort of try things, and it's 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 you know going to the dub was hell because even the dubbing engineers were like why is this not working because it's you know it doesn't sound right and it's different and it's doing things that aren't right and different and you know and fortunately there were fantastic dubbing engineers and we all kind of locked down you know, for about three weeks. And I even went and started editing Pro Tools as well, because I realized things weren't working. And we just moved things around and they tried stuff. And it was a real sort of team effort to like, okay, this is all weird. It doesn't really work the way we sh it should work. And they figured it out. I figured out a few more things and it was, it was great. And I think at the end of that, I was quite convinced I'd never get work again, because I wasn't sure it was working. And then I got a few calls from people, you know, saying, just saw that. That's really interesting and very different. It's a quite a, what seemed to be quite a risk at the time. And, and now it just seems like a calling card, doesn't it? Well, it's a cliche now. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's embarrassing. It's an embarrassing cliche. <laughs> well, only because people copied you. That's why. Well, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, um, it's, it's very easy to do. It's one of those things that, that I think part of it was, uh, you know, I'd always loved minimalist music. So I, I had, it had a lot more to do with Steve Reich and, Philip Glass at the time than, you know, than, than Hans, really. Um, and that, Would you date it back to the video installations you're talking about? Is there a yes. certain a bit of... There was yeah. definitely some weird stuff. I, I mean, you could probably look back at my jingles from, you know, 1991, and you could probably hear me trying to do things that I didn't, I wasn't doing very well and did extremely unsuccessfully until I figured it out on Born finally. You know. when, uh, when did you realize, uh, John, why contracts were important uh, and, and when did you begin to sort of understand the nuts and bolts of what contracts were and that why they're uh, why they're important was that prior to getting an agent did an agent 
help you understand that? Where, where did that begin, your, your understanding of why that was important? Well, I was, I was lucky. I was with a kind of a, I went and did advertising with a, a company called Aerodell in London and Maggie Rodford, um, who's sort of an agent. Um, she's an agent for some people, but at the time she basically had a bunch of composers and she was very open about all of it. It was very transparent. Um, even though you're one of 14 composers, you know, everybody got paid the same based on sort of, you know, a system of what it was for, how many territories it was going to and things. And I just started to really understand the sort of the, the inner workings of, of what, you know, the first checks from PRS and, and really I realized that this was something, you know, again, it's an investment. So I always just took money from working and spent it on gear and then knew that the royalties were always going to pay for everything else. And that was going to be this kind of continuous. So I, I picked up information. I was very shocked when I got to America though. And I remember Han saying to me, so you're going to have to sign this contract and it's work for hire. And I, I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you have no rights. You have no, copyright, no, no, uh, nothing at all. And I, I was, I couldn't believe that they did that because they didn't do it in England at the time. There'd been murmurs of it, but they didn't do it. And so when I got to Hollywood and read the first contracts, I was really shocked at how kind of, you know, obscenely kind of, uh, I don't know, they're, 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 they, they just force you out of a lot of things that up until that point, until Hollywood invented it, had been very, very much about, you know, we as composers, as artists, you know, there's a, there's a, a sort of a, a child there that you own and you don't in Hollywood. You're, you're yeah. really just kind of, uh, you're, Pasting the walls for them in a way, and that was that was a bit painful. I found that painful. Yeah, I mean, songwriters are quite different, right? I, it, the composers are the only music creators who don't own their own copyrights. So, uh, it you know, com uh, songwriters retain at least the writer's share sometimes a piece of the. Uh, yeah, but the, they try. I mean, they try. They yeah, do, they, uh, there's yeah. a lot of animation films I've done where people have been asked to write songs and. And at the very least, they've been asked for half of the publishing. And, you know, there's a few few people who I won't mention who just told them to go, F you know. <laughs> um, it said, Pinar, have you, have you uh, what's been your experience? Because I know both of you have a very broad musical background. Do you have, have you had any experience in terms of writing songs specifically for films? And how has that experience been for you uh, in terms of, uh, understand, you know, in terms of, you know, both the copyright piece and I guess primarily around the copyright, um, have you both, uh, I, I know you've done things, but how has your experience been around that? I haven't had a lot of song experience in films, to be honest. I've done a couple of things uh, that were already based on the score that kind of became a song uh, kind of thing, but um, not a whole lot. So I'm sure Sid has done more. Yeah, for me, I mean, I've I've, I've written a bunch of or, original songs for <clears throat> television and film. Um, and, you know, they kind of sometimes, oftentimes they're functioning many in many ways, like my score is. They're, they're following sort of the same sort of deals. Um, and um, there have been times that I've tried to fight for owning the publishing and not giving up half of it. And, and that's led to hitting a brick wall, you know, like there's nothing there's precedent that they a lot of studios will sort of stand by and or they'll claim there's precedent um and and they're like well if we change it for you you know um we, that that's the sort of like excuse that you get um so in exchange for that i've also um if i'm honest about it i've made them pay for it um so you know when we have uh, you know we've we've written original songs i've done a bunch of original songs for this is us um, we've had, and, and, and two of the songs that I wrote, um, ended up in the top five in, in the U S charts, like in the pop charts, like not soundtrack charts in the pop charts, like for, you know, four or five weeks straight in, in a couple, couple moments in these, the show that big, that many people watching the song had impact. Um, so I began to learn and sort of like when we were negotiating our deals for future seasons, just making sure that I was paid more than enough that I needed to be paid to actually compose the song in the first place. I would still get my writer's share, obviously, from my royalties that, of course, that would never go away. But, um, you know, the, the idea being that if you're going to take, you know, half of my publishing or you're going to take my publish, or so you're going to take my publishing, um, 
effectively on some of these pieces, then, um, which is the case for most people writing original songs for television and film. It's not like, it's not like that, you know, Netflix deal where they're like, we're going to fully buy you out <laughs> of all your, of all your backend. Um, so, um, you know, you begin to see your value and see that, hey, I'm writing stuff that is also like leading, these are like entering the charts, you know, um, unexpected and not something that anybody on the show would have imagined, but it is. And um, so uh, in a nutshell, um, my scoring deals and my songwriting deals are similar in terms of how they're structured. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think it just points out to the fact that, or points to the fact that really the only ongoing income that any of us get in film and television really is uh, from the performance royalties. Whereas songwriters will make money off the publishing, they'll make money off sync, they'll make off, you know, money off of mechanicals. There are many different streams of income for songwriters and good for them. However, as uh, we find that uh, the, the rules are different, right? Um, in terms of film studios, in terms of essentially creating, Sid, you're talking about essentially creating the same value uh, as someone else who who would create a song that's in the pop charts or it's on the pop charts. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a real challenge. Um, you know, in some ways we can understand why the studios might want to uh, be able to own those rights so that they can move things around and put things in different places very quickly without having to come back and renegotiate. However, there is a, a price for us as composers. Um, so, you know, Sid, you talked about buyouts. And that is a really sore topic right now in the industry, mm -hmm. because without uh, performance royalties, if we do total buyouts, essentially, the money we get up front, that's all there is. And that's all there is forever uh, from that project. Um, you had talked about working on a, you know, your first hit show. I guess I'm, I'm wondering what your uh, advice would be to young composers who are just getting started out. Um, recognizing your experience of the difference between a hit show and not a hit show? You know, I wish that, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a little, it's my advice to the young composers, obviously, is don't, don't take those shitty deals that they offer you. Um, and when they say to you that, um, you know, th this is a full buyout and uh, we're going to buy you out of your performance royalties and this is how it's done, um, we, you can, they can know confidently that that is not how it's done. Um, and um, and, 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 and I know specifically with some studios, um, and, 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 you know, that when you go back to them and you say, well, um, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, if they make the argument that, you know, this is how it's done, I, I mean, they're not allowed to do that from my understanding either. So, um, so one thing is educating young composers on, on that piece of it. Um, second thing is honestly, flatly, like, frankly, just telling them how much money they can make if they don't do it. I mean, I think if I knew, I didn't, fortunately, I didn't make any sort of I, I, bad decisions. I was always educated about royalties. I always knew what I was getting into. I had good people representing me. Um, I had good lawyers who were doing my deals for Universal when I was signed there as an artist. I had good lawyers who were doing my deals for This Is Us and these other shows. So I was always sort of like in good company, people, people who were taking care of me. Now that's not always the case with people, um, with a lot of young composers. So I wish there were a way, and this is something here where like you can share with young composers, like, hey, if you have a successful film or successful show, this is the kind of performance royalty income you could actually make, you know? Um, and I would be happy to tell them how much money I've made doing it. So they would never ever think twice yeah. about sort of signing it away. I have no problem, I have no so, shame in that, yeah. Well, your, your phone is gonna ring off the hook. Um, so uh, I don't even know if you say that anymore. There's no hooks, but um, you know what, uh, so this is a perfect transition to a shameless plug for your music, your future. Uh, if you look on the website and, and hopefully you also sign up as a supporter, uh, nonprofit organization, uh, by composers, for composers. You look at the website and there are some uh, tremendously talented composers, including folks on this panel here, who uh, essentially support the education of composers to understand what the real 100 year deal is. As Sid, you were saying a lot of people don't know. And also there are pie charts which show what 
hit shows or even modest hit shows might earn for composers, uh, you know, as you were, as you've all talked about in terms of participating in the revenue, in the success of hit shows and films that you create. So I think it's a really, really good point for, for everyone to really educate themselves. So your music, your future is certain one, uh, one way, um, talking to Sid and other composers, uh, who, and listen, I always feel there are composers, uh, and by the way, I'm stealing this from Dan Folliart, who used to be the, uh, head of the Society of Composers and Lyricists and now is on the ASCAP board. But what he's always said is that there's two kinds of composers. There are composers who have the community gene and there are composers who don't. Uh, and I think you'll find that there are more and more composers that do. Uh, you can find out from your friends how to address things. There are a lot of resources you have. You can call the membership uh, departments of the PROs that you uh, belong to. You can talk to uh, organizations like volunteer lawyers for the arts where there are attorneys which will you know who will uh, donate services to uh, composers who are first working on their contracts or at least be able to give them some advice so I think Sid your your idea of education uh, and, and I, I think composers understanding that there are many sources of information that that it, that are at their disposal uh, even though they think they may be all alone, they're, they're really not. Um, you know, Pinar, just to, to go back to you, uh, what are your thoughts about, you know, thinking about your beginning and, and sort of understanding what you understand now? I guess my first question is, uh, what role has your, you know, look, as people start out, they don't have agents. Um, you have an agent. Your agent uh, is... Um, is an important part of your team. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what your agent does for you or agents do for people in general um, and what education or learnings you may have had from your agent or your experiences with your agent. Yeah, John and I, we have, we have the same uh, agents and um, they're honestly, I mean, I, my very first agent, I was about 23 years old, 24 years old. I remember I was working for, um, William Ross, who's an amazing arranger, orchestrator, composer. Um, and I got this film, I'm sorry, a video game. Um, and I was clueless as to how to do the, the deals and everything. And uh, it was like, okay, I'll make an introduction. And with, it used to be um, Randy Gerson at first artist management. That was my very first agent. And I hadn't done anything up, up until that point. And uh, so they, from that, um, they actually educated me I, in an area that I was completely clueless in because I, I would read agreements and also English is not my first language, obviously. So I would read these agreements. It's like a bunch of English words that mean nothing together. <laughs> and uh, so they really helped me understand from the start. And now um, I feel like I kind of found my agent soulmates um, and they, they do a lot of things. It's, it's beyond the agreements and looking out for you and making sure um, that you are able to concentrate on what, what we're supposed to concentrate on because ultimately what we do most of the time should be creating, you know? Um, and uh, so it's really important to be surrounded by people that, that can look out for you. That doesn't mean we don't know about things, but I think for, for me anyway, I have really had to learn things along the way and I needed to be educated. I'm still a uh, long ways from really understanding a lot of these things, but um, I'm doing better. But, but I mean, you, you've yeah. learned, I was just say, you've learned to advocate for yourself. I didn't interrupt you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, because it's, it's, it's all kind of um, cause and effect, right? You know, once you start getting some money, you start understanding, oh, this is worth that. So next time you get a project, you negotiate that when you look at that one differently. Uh, from what you get paid as a fee or a package or anything else and, and beyond. So it just makes you look at your work and the time that you're going to put into it um, in a whole different way. And whether it's your agents or attorney or in both, in my case, um, it's really, really important that, that they look up. And for me, even like to this date, I look at the, the agreement. I mean, the long form agreements, I mean, I have no time to read it. You just kind of like look at the bullet points and hope <laughs> that it's, uh, but I mean, in my case, you know, you, that's where you really trust your team and really yeah. understand. Um, yeah. It's important. I think people understand how agents 
uh, work uh, that they will commission the upfront fees, but not the performance roles. This is something that's, again, part of the 100-year-old deal that uh, performance royalties are for the composers, uh, that those are not commissioned. Joel, you know that? Oh, please, yeah, it's, please. Like it's, a, it's a good point. Please bring yeah. that up. It used to be that um, everything was commissioned by agents and then these new up, you know, upstart agents came along called <laughs> um, uh, Mike Gorfain and Sam Schwartz <laughs> a long time ago. I think they, I mean, I might be wrong about this, but my understanding is that they kind of came in and said, all right, we're going to, they poached a lot of really good clients by basically saying, okay, the one thing we won't commission is, uh, is your royalty streams. And uh, so it's really only been in effect, I don't know, 35, 40 years or something like that. I don't know how long they've been doing it. Um, and so that's one of the problems with some of these um, Netflix deals that came up, of course, is, you know, much as you love, I love my agent, but agents are human and human nature is that if a deal comes up where they can commission all of the money, um, because it's all up front, that is very different from if they basically commission half of the money because half of yep. it is a fee and then half of it is the royalty. Uh, so so a agents being, uh, you know, as you said, human and also uh, loving composers, loving the business they're in. But I think it's important to understand, as you're saying, John, that, uh, that um, sometimes the, the letter of, uh, it, it, when you look at the agreements, that what uh, benefits composers doesn't necessarily 100% align with what benefits agents. And it certainly is something that it's important for composers to understand. And just like everything else, things are negotiable. Um, certainly when yeah. you reach the, the, the level that the three of you have, uh, I think it's just important for composers to understand that. So just to sort of sum up some of the takeaways from what we discussed today that composers really need to understand in terms of contracts and rights and collection of royalties. So it's really important to understand your contract, the copyrights, who owns it, uh, understanding what we discussed today about work for hire. You don't own the copyright, but you do... Uh, you are able to collect performance royalties through your PRO of your choice, that uh, collecting performance royalties on the writer's share, even potentially in the publisher's share, uh, is really the only continuing income that composers get, uh, which is different than songwriters. There are sync fees and mechanicals and package fees um, discussed, which sync fees really only relate to songs, mechanicals only to songs. There's uh, basically, mechanicals used to be really just about selling uh, records, um, but mechanicals now exist in streaming. Really, composers have package fees where we have to pay uh, for the orchestras and for the synths and, and whatever players you bring for our, our single fee. So it's important to know these, these things and uh, how they affect your career. It's really important to understand your choices that there's a potential to negotiate things. It's not, you don't have to take any deal that's just given. Uh, you know, uh, Sid had talked about streaming services that are talking about buyouts. Uh, it, it, those are negotiable. You can always push back. That's not the way things are typically done and have been done for the last hundred years. Um, know your resources, that member services at your PRO can be a tremendous resource, that not-for-profit or not -for -profit attorneys, I think we talked about, uh, the uh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts and many others are great places to turn to for information. That the Society of Composers and Lyricists is a great place to turn to in terms of understanding uh, how things work in the industry. Sona is a great organization for songwriters. And of course, Your Music, Your Future, uh, the organization which I am partial to because I'm founder of it, is a great place to, as Sid said, look at charts see what the work that you've done is worth uh, and make sure that when you make decisions that you understand the ramification of those decisions. So uh, above all, it's really important to remember that we have to believe in our work and believing in our work means believing that what we create has value, that it is important in the world, that it's important to the project you're working on and that you need to be compensated fairly for it. So um, listen, I wanted to, I want to thank again, this stellar group of, 
amazing, talented composers, but also people with the community gene for joining us here today. Uh, Pinar Toprak, John Powell, and Sid Kosla. Thank you guys so much. Um, really appreciate your time and you know, appreciate what you're dedicate your dedication to the community and helping share your knowledge. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Joel. Nice to see you, Pinar and John, and uh, hopefully we can do this again in person soon. Thank you.